how to score 760 on the GMAT. My name is Rajo Sadana. I'm one of the co-founders of eGMAT. I'm going to be your main host today. In this webinar, we're going to talk about, you know, how to plan for your GMAT. And and, and the, the title says how to score, score 760 on the GMAT. But overall, we're going to talk about uh, our general strategies to build, build a study plan. How do you, you know, from those strategies, how do you identify the metrics that you need to, to aim for? And then how do you study towards... Uh, uh, achieving those metrics and, and essentially um, uh, uh, getting to that score. So how do you track your preparation as it's, as it happens? So um, I have this one question. Where are you in your preparation? And uh, if you have not responded to this one, please do so. Um, so what we really see is uh, a really healthy mix of folks. So you, about 80-odd uh, percent of people who are in that just started in the middle and towards the end with, you know, uh, three similarly sized groups in, in, in uh, over here, and then two small groups. The few folks who are yet to start, and then um, uh, uh, a few folks who are retaking the test as well. So that's good. That gives us some some good context here. Uh, in terms of when do people plan to take the GMAT, uh, a lot of you haven't decided on a date as of yet. That's about thirty uh, percent. Next, and again, three similarly sized groups uh, around the thirty percent mark each. 46 to 75 days and 31 to 45 days. Uh, and then about 14% of the people who are planning to take the GMAT in the next 15 days as well. So that's good. I'm going to ask this one other question, which I think is, um, uh, which edition of the GMAT uh, do you prefer or do you plan to take? And uh, let me put in that question over here. We asked this question when you register on the platform. Uh, it'll be interesting to really see those who are here. Let's just edit this and open the poll. Um, yeah, which edition of the GMAT do you plan to take? The current edition, the focus edition, or um, uh, those of you not sure, um, you can really just say, I'm not sure. If you don't know which one, if you're undecided, uh, then that, the third option's for you guys. Okay, let's get some more responses here. All right, let me end this poll. I'm going to broadcast the results. And you can really see about 27% of the people plan to take the focus edition, but half the class wants, plans to take the, the, the current GMAT, and another 24% or a very similar number are, are still unsure. They could go either way. That's phenomenal. If you are an EG matter, if you plan to take the focus edition, we've just uh, uh, released a, a, a brand new GMAT planner. Um, uh, for those of you who've gone through our current uh, PSP personalized study planner, this one's about three X as comprehensive as the current PSP. We want, if you want to, you know, try it out, take an early trial. That'll be uh, something that we'd love for you to to try it out uh, and, and and give your feedback. Just write to me at rajatari-shima.com. If you're an EG matter, you know my email address, and 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 say I'd like to try out the new planner. Please uh, sign me up. I uh, would love to get some feedback from you guys. So so definitely do that. Okay. So before we get into the crux of the webinar, we also have some free webinars. We have a free CR webinar. That's next week. In this, we talk about uh, pre-thinking is the most important uh, processes when it comes to tackling CR questions. So uh, uh, again, if CR is an area where you need help and, and you, you, you're off from that, that 90th percentile ability level, then definitely register for this. And then if you have a free webinar on GMAT algebra, that is also um, uh, the following week on, on, on Sunday, the 17th of September. Click on that, register for that, and uh, there we'll focus on inequalities and absolute value. Um, so again, same time as as is today. Okay. With that, let me go right into the webinar pane. Uh, the screen will have changed for you, and what you'd see is a presentation along with a Q and A pod. Let me just make sure the Q and A pods there. So, just some um, housekeeping. Uh, uh, tips. So the Q&A pod is the question and answer pod, which is the one which is below the presentation. This is the one that I'm moving right now, is for your questions and my answers. So if you have a question, pose it here, it goes in a queue, and that way I get to it. Everything on the right-hand side, this, this yes-no poll over here, is, is a place for my questions and your answers. Please do not put your questions in this um, in, 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 uh, on the right-hand side, because I clear these polls out. And, and one of the worst things that could happen is that you, you pose a good question and then I clear it out and the question gets lost. So that way, please pose your question in the Q&A pod. That way they go in a queue and we answer those questions. 
with that, let's move forward. So the agenda for this webinar is very, very simple. We're going to start with how the GMAT works. And, and a lot of people don't understand how the GMAT works. In fact, uh, a lot of them, um, in fact, with the focus edition, they're even trying to really figure out, hey, is it a non-adaptive test? Is it, you know, if you go on GMAT Club, you'd see a bunch of discussions about uh, how the GMAT works uh, with regards to question adaptive, block adaptive, section adaptive, and all of that. So we'll talk about how the, the fundamentals of the GMAT, how it works, and and, and how to, and, and when you do that, it'll help address questions such as, hey, should you worry about the first six questions, first 10 questions, um, uh, versus how you plan for your preparation? What is the importance of those questions? What do those questions indicate? Um, in general, it'll also tell you a lot about how should you think about building your study plan, which is our second agenda point. And then once you understand how to build a study plan, uh, we'll talk about how do you prepare, how do you track your um, uh, improvement so that, you know, preparing for the, studying for the GMAT is not just about having a good study plan. That's something that you do on day one, but then beyond that, it's the execution of that. That's what's going to come in. And, and yes, uh, uh, Noel, uh, 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 we will, I, I'll share this PDF with you. Absolutely. So, so that's a good question. Um, All right, so that's what we will do overall. Let me actually hide this poll. Uh, I don't know why people are, are uh, selecting yes or no. I haven't asked any any such question. Okay, um, I have some questions which are, you know, I see a couple of questions which are a bit more personal. Um, so um, I'll answer those, but then beyond that, if you have such questions, please reserve them towards the end. I'd be happy to address those. It's just that with the 120 people in the webinar, just those questions don't do good to the rest of folks who are here to learn about uh, about the strategy piece. If you're planning to take the test now, uh, uh, Samyak says, I'm planning to take the test now and keep the score for a couple of years and apply when the time is right. Should you go for the focus edition or the, or the current GMAT? Either one would work, in my opinion, today. I mean, we'll, we'll make decisions based on the best information that we have. Um, the only thing that I can tell you is if you plan to, to go into consulting, corporate strategy, the focus edition, in my opinion, um, uh, you know, having known both the tests, is uh, is a bit better suited for uh, for those positions. I mean, the, 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 the data insight section is phenomenal with regards to, you know, what you, the kind of uh, skills that you, you need during consulting and other pieces. But other than that, you know, either one would work. Uh, even if you take the current GMAT two years down the line, that score will be just as valid. That's the best we can really say, given the information today. And um, Praveen says, doesn't writing brief summary for after doing the exam waste time? If not, how much to write? Again, Praveen, A, it doesn't waste time because overwhelming your brain means whatever you read, whatever time you spend reading the passage goes to absolute zero. So, so it makes sense to spend an extra five seconds to write something down and make sure the, the minute and a half to two minutes that you spend reading the passage are, are you know are spent in a useful manner versus just rushing through the passage and and not taking summary overall. So um, so yeah, so that's something that I'd say definitely. If your brain's being getting overwhelmed, definitely write summary. The goal needs to be that you know the two goals with regards to RC one is to build your ability enough so that your brain doesn't get overwhelmed fairly easily. But even then, you're talking about a 400 you know 350 to 400 word passage. You'd have to write things down least two or three times and that definitely helps um the only exception to this is if the passage is on a topic that's very familiar to you then you can you know you can read through it gmat focus versus um, the current gmat in my opinion the focus is better suited for consulting again there's no empirical data around it but you know having spoken to a lot of consultants having you know having evaluated both the tests if you want to go for consulting or corporate strategy definitely go for the focus edition is what my opinion would be Okay, like I said, how do I choose between the, the current GMAT and GMAT focus? Three steps. One is, you know, familiarize yourself with the format of both the, the, the question types. So I'd recommend solving you know, about 100 questions uh, on the GMAT. About 20 of them should be in the data insights part of it. The other 80 could be, you know, quant verbal. And then um, take the, the official mock test and then um, the current GMAT focus mock. Both of them have no, no non-overlapping set of questions. And then make a decision. Okay. All right. IB, either one should work. Frankly, GMAT focus is a better fit in my opinion. But again, as I said, we don't have a lot of data around it, but that's my personal opinion um, in this case. Okay. With that, let's go forward. Let's talk about what does it take to ace a GMAT. Uh, guys, 
personal questions towards the end. And that was just one question that I took. I sh probably shouldn't have taken it. I should have left it to the end because otherwise we won't get started with the webinar. So our goal here is to make sure each one of you has a clear idea about how to go about preparing for the test and, and, and creating a study plan for whatever score you're aiming for. And one of the first things that I will tell you, and I'll ask you to write down very few things in this webinar, as when it comes to acing the GMAT, it's about this one word or two words, building ability. Uh, and, and the reason why I really say this is because a lot of times when we think about preparing for the GMAT, we focus on these things over here. And these are important, but these are just 20% of all of what it is. These are eight, this ability or having the ability to to really answer questions um, correctly is, is, is what 80% of everything is. And frankly, if you have the ability, if you are here, if you do this 80%, you'll have automatic answers to these 20%. And, uh, and, and I mean, the question that, you, that the individual asked right now, uh, should you rake notes or not? That'd be a moot point if, um, uh, if, you, if you have the ability in RC because you would automatically know unless and until you take some notes down, you're not going to be able to, to get questions and hard passages right. Okay. Now, how many of you, when, you know, and we asked this question earlier, which phase of GMAT preparation you were in? And a lot of you were in the early to middle, and some of you were in the towards the end as well. How many of you worry right in the beginning, those of you are in the early to middle phases? How many of you are worrying about, you know, timing, exam strategy? You can put type your answers in here in the short answer part. Right at the very beginning of worrying about these things right now. Okay. Uh, please don't post your answers in the Q&A pod. That's the pod right below the presentation. On the right-hand side is where you ought to post your answers. If you're worrying about them, wrong thing to worry about. Uh, don't worry about those things right now. In the beginning, if you're not taking longer to answer questions, then you're not learning anyway. Let me just stay, say this. If you take longer to answer questions, but your accuracy is good, you're on the right path. If you're answering questions quickly, but your accuracy isn't improving, you're on the wrong path. You're not going to go anywhere. Okay. So, 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 so focus on building ability. Don't focus on this. 80 to 90 percent of the time, if you build ability, timing takes care of it uh, itself. Exam strategy is something that you'll be able to understand and answer those questions automatically if you focus on building ability. Okay. Um, so let's move forward. What is ability? Ability on the GMAT is not an abstract term. It's a very defined term. There's a metric assigned to every subsection. In fact, when you think about the current GMAT, your SC score, there's a, it has it has an ability associated, associated with it. And we're going to see that. When you think about your data insights, you know, when you think about um, MSR, two-part analysis, when you think about uh, um, uh, GINTA, there's an ability score associated with it. So it's a very, very um, it's it's a quantitative term when it comes to uh, 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 to ability. Okay, um, so uh, and I want to differentiate this with accuracy because when it comes to the GMAT, as you go on, you know, GMAT Club and Reddit, you're going to see a lot of people talking about the accuracy level of questions. Uh, and 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 accuracy is a very vague term on 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 the GMAT. Uh, overall. So what is accuracy? It's an absolute measure. When you take a 10 question quiz, you get eight out of those 10 questions that you say my accuracy is 80%. Now, um, it doesn't tell you how well you've done, just to be very frank. You know, some people might give themselves a pat on the back if they get eight out of 10 questions correctly. And 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 they say, hey, this is great uh, because I got eight out of those 10 questions correctly. Let me just write out 10 properly. Um, now, if these eight out of 10 questions, if, if these questions are all medium, you know, you were talking about a 60th percentile ability um, overall uh, 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 with 80% accuracy. If these questions are hard, then you're talking about 97th percentile ability, which, again, is, is what we care about. So, so the context in terms of accuracy is what gives us ability. It tells you how good you are compared to other test takers. On the GMAT, this word ability is a true measure. Okay. Now, to understand the context of ability, I'm going to just simulate an adaptive test algorithm. This is, um, this is a very simplistic uh, algorithm, but then it tells you the essence of the GMAT. The GMAT works in a bit more sophisticated manner, but, but this will tell you how, how the GMAT works. So what we have are two students, case we're calling them case, the, case one and case two, and we're going to simulate the first five questions for each one of these two students. So student one or case one is, is, is gets the first question, which is of the median difficulty level. He gets that right. He gets a second question, which is of a 
uh, of a slightly higher difficulty level. On the y-axis, we have increasing difficulty levels. So the higher you go on y-axis, the most challenging, the more challenging a question becomes. So you can really see as I go from question one to question two, I'm going higher on the y-axis. So question two is more challenging. The student gets that right as well. Gets a third question, which is slightly less challenging. The student gets that wrong. Then he gets the fourth question, which is which is slightly easier. You can see if I draw horizontal lines between question number two and question number three, fourth question is smack in the middle of it. Gets that right. Gets the fifth question slightly more challenging. Yeah, uh, he gets that wrong. So that's student one, case one. That's all that we're going to simulate for this particular individual. Let's go to student two or case two. Gets the first question, which is uh, you know median difficulty level. Gets that wrong. Gets the second question, which is uh, easier. Gets that right. Gets the third question, which is slightly more challenging. You can see we're going higher on the y-axis here. Um, uh, he, he gets that wrong. Gets the fourth question, which is slightly easier. Gets that right. And gets the fifth question, uh, which is slightly more challenging. Gets that right as well. So I want to ask you, if, if at the end of question number five, if I were to you know, uh, close the test and, uh, and really just uh, take their end scores, who'd have a higher score? Who's doing better at the end of question number five? So this is where... We are ending the test. Who do you think would get a higher score? Okay, don't post your answers in the Q&A pod, guys. Three, two, and one. Let me end the poll. broadcast the results and you can really see 81% of the students think student one is doing better uh, but 19% of folks think student two is doing better. Student one would get a higher score. Now why do you think student one would get a higher score? The accuracy is identical. You know this case one of student has answered three out of five questions correctly. Case two has also answered three out of five questions correctly. Okay harder questions solved. You got harder questions. The difficulty level of the question, yes, absolutely. So even though both have identical accuracy, student one or, or case one, you know, the accuracy is 60% for both of them. Um, he got five questions. Each one of them was either at the average difficulty level or above the average difficulty level. For student two or case two, he only got the first question, which was at the average difficulty level. Every other question was below the average difficulty level. In fact, the test did not even serve difficult questions to, to this particular individual because the test did not deem him or her fit to, to, to get difficult questions served. So when it comes to acing the GMAT, you have two challenges that you need to overcome. One is to make sure that the test serves difficult questions to you. The second is to make sure that you answer those correctly. These are the two challenges that you have. And you answer them correctly or answer enough of them correctly that the test continues to serve difficult questions to you. Okay. Um, so I have two questions here, both by EG Matters. Um, so um, Ank says, I've subscribed to EG Matters. Can I have a one-on-one -on -one session with the strategies? I have lots of queries that need to be clear. Um, go through the Getting Started course. If you have questions, write to us. We also have onboarding sessions twice a week. So, so definitely uh, 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 make sure you attend those. And then, you know, if you have queries that we are unable to answer over a personalized video, we'll have a one-on-one -on -one session with you. That's something that we'll definitely have overall. Um, and then if you have questions about, actually, you, I see a bunch of questions that are out here. You'd be able to answer most of those questions over here. Um, uh, uh, so, so if you not, if not, you know, please ask those questions towards the end of the webinar. I'd be happy to answer those questions. Again, any personal questions, any questions about EGMAX courses and preparation, just uh, uh, either write to me, you know, um, you can reach out to me at roger.e-gmat or wait till the end, I'd spend spare some time overall. Ardi has a great question. He says, how do you know you're getting the harder questions on, on the real test? Uh, uh, first thing, I don't recommend that you, you judge whether you're getting harder or easier questions. Just stay focused on that particular question only. It's, it's the way, you know, I play a lot of, I used to play a lot of cricket. I no longer play cricket. Uh, but uh, while playing cricket, you know, you, know you, you face different bowlers. When you're facing a bowler, focus on the next ball that the person, the bowler is going to bowl. Don't worry about which one, who's going to bowl the next over and the over after that. You can do that 
in the break between the overs, but not while facing a bowler A. Don't worry about bowler B or C. Same way when you're taking the test, worry about the question at hand, not don't worry about other things. Now, at the same time, you will see some questions that you are unable to answer and, 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 and don't get hung up on them because if you don't see such questions, you should worry about the test. Uh, but overall, during your preparation, if your preparation is good, if your uh, metrics are good, uh, then 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 uh, uh, then you know you would get a good score. Remember this: your performance on the test is a reflection of uh, of, of of your preparation. Um, we can predict your scores within the EGMAT platform uh, within ninety five percent certainty, and we can also really say. If your metrics are bad, as we are 95% certain you're not going to get a good score. If your metrics are good, we are 95% certain you're going to get a good score. So, so just perform the way uh, you, 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 you're you practicing uh, and, and you do well. Okay. Now, how many of you have heard the GMAT's a really complex thing? Don't try and... Uh, uh, don't try and... And, um, and, and you know, worry, don't try and understand the algorithm because the algorithm is, is very, very challenging. How many of you have heard that? Okay, all right. But I'm gonna share my email ID because a few of you are asking. Um, perfect. We won't say that I, I something else there because in my opinion, the algorithm is fairly simple. Um, it's actually um, a fairly simple algorithm if you're an algorithm designer. Um, you know, it's an algorithm that the current GMAT, that is, that came out about 19 years back or so. So the state of art is what it was then overall. But but essentially, if you've hired someone, you know, uh, and the way you make decisions, that's the same way the GMAT makes decisions. How many of you have hired anyone? How many of you have hired anyone, you know, whether to work for you or to as a part of your team? So even if you haven't, if you've gotten through the process of hiring, you would, um, you'd, you'd probably be able to understand how it works. So let's say in an organization, there are five levels and, and, and starting from you know, the level of an analyst, which is the lowest level to an executive vice president. And, and you have to interview an individual and place our individual in, um, in, in essentially uh, one of these levels. So let's say, so the, one of the best things you do, you do is you say, okay, got to minimize the distance between uh, where I start from versus where I end. So I'm going to start with the director level. So I'm going to ask three questions. And let's say if I ask three questions and this is how the person responds. What's going to be your next question? The person gets the first question right, the second and the third question wrong. What, what, which level would the next question be? Okay, you could have it at a manager level. You could really say, let me just do one more director level. Both of them would be good options, but you would definitely not put a VP level question to this person. So let's say I, I do one, two, and three. Three manager level questions, correct. What would you do next? I'm going to go back to director level, correct. So I'm going to do one, two, director level correct. What would you do next? And it's VP. Good. So I'm going to do this. Okay, so I'm going to do a control Z. And this. What's your judgment? Where do you think this guy belongs? I'm going to clear. Yeah, this guy probably is at a VP or a director level or somewhere in between. Maybe the senior director, maybe a junior VP, but but somewhere over there. Okay. Now, how how difficult was this decision making? It's fairly easy, right? It's a bit laborious, but it's fairly easy. You need to have that question bank. But but if you have that question bank, the decisions are fairly simple. That's how the GMAT works as well. Now, at this point, at this point, 
if I if I if I said you have three more questions, which level would you put those questions, or how would you divide three more questions? Uh, which level would those questions be? VPN director, you, no, okay. Divi up three more questions. Okay. All three VP, okay. That's one approach. Director and then VP. So the way I would do it, and again, remember, I'm a, a more risk-averse person. As entrepreneurs, we are very, very risk-averse. A lot of people say entrepreneurs are risk-takers, but entrepreneurs who use their own money are risk-averse. So I'm going to do, essentially, two questions at a director level. I'm gonna, so I'm, star is the slots for questions. I'm going to do two questions at a director level. Why would I do that? Because if this person answers these two questions correctly, I am sure this guy belong is above a director level. So that's my only level is VP. Okay. If I put in VP level questions and the, it still tick star, tick star, uh, 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 correct wrong, correct wrong, then then I'm, I may still be confused. But if I put in director level questions, I can be certain about whether to place him in the VP level or not. So whether he go, belongs above the director level or not. So that's where I would put two questions over there. And based on those two questions, I'd really make a decision on the third question overall. So that's how I would approach it. But again, even this decision making is, is fairly simple. It's fairly standard. And that's what all of this is. Now, how many levels do you think the GMAT has? How many levels do you think? How many levels are there in this on this particular slide? Five. How many levels are there on this particular slide? Five. How many levels do you think the GMAT has? Now draw a parallel. How many levels does the GMAT place you in? Guys, this is, for me, if you were to think about it, this is one of the easiest questions. What's the lowest score on the GMAT? What's the lowest score? 200. What's the highest score? 800. What's the interval? What's the granularity? What's how does how do scores 10? How many levels does it lead to? 61, not 60, because both 200 and 800 are possible. Right? You could really see five levels here, but you could not translate that into, into 61 levels on the GMAT. Why was it challenging? Pure application, right? You had to interview and place someone over here. Similarly, the GMAT has to give serve you questions and place you in one of these 61 levels. Yes, 46 levels. That's good. That's still good thinking. Where are those 46 levels? When you say 6 to 51, where are these 46 levels? In quant, you have 46 levels. And in verbal, you have 46 levels. Correct? And those combined then translate to these 61 levels. Correct? That's essentially the, uh, 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 the, the overall essence of how the test works. Okay. So... So far, so good. Okay. Now, no, it's not 45 times to increase difficulty. Let me be very clear. It's not 45 times to increase difficulty. Okay. The difficulty level of questions served is, is still the same. How many of you go to the gym? Okay, you do. Let's say, uh, so there are multiple ways to, to kind of evaluate the, someone's strength. One way is to really say, hey, if I'm squatting, how much weight can I squat with? Can I do it with 50 pounds, 100 pounds, 150 pounds, and so on and so forth. Another way to really do it is to really say, okay, how many squats can I do with 50 pounds? How many squats can I do with 100 pounds? That's another way to evaluate you as well. So in our opinion, you know, the GMAT has five levels of difficulty. 
but based on how many questions you get right um, on the test, they assign weights to this and give you a weighted score, and that's how they put you in these levels. Okay. Now, for those of you who are worrying about the GMAT focus, how many sections does the GMAT focus have? Rather, actually, let's go back. How many levels does, does, does the GMAT focus have? How many levels does the GMAT focus have? Same 61, 205. I'll repeat the gym piece over there. So um, same 61, right? Here, 205. Okay. Correct. Now, how many sections does the GMAT focus have? Three, right? What are the scoring ranges for each of those three sections? The quant, quant, verbal, and DI, what are the score ranges? What can be the maximum quant score you'd get on GMAT focus? No, not 51. GMAT focus, not the current GMAT. 90, yes. All right, what's the minimum score that you can get on GMAT focus? 60. How many levels does that give you? 31, correct? 31 levels. So overall, how many levels do we have? 31 times three, considering that three sections over there, uh, quant, verbal, and data insights. Everyone with me? 93 levels, correct? On the current GMAT, your scoring is from six to 51. How many levels are we talking about here? Forty-five, okay, or actually forty-six levels. Why? Because both are both are uh, acceptable scores. So forty-six times two. How many total levels are there? Ninety-two. Correct. Ninety-two, and uh, in in the current GMAT, ninety-three on GMAT focus. Do you see the similarity between between the current GMAT and GMAT focus? Can you see the similarity? These 92 levels are translated into the score of 200 to 800. These 93 levels over here translate to the scores of uh, essentially 205 to 805. AW and IR don't account, uh, they're not included in the, the score of 800. Um, uh, there is no IR on GMAT focus anyway. And for those of you who don't know GMAT focus, uh, it's the new GMAT, which will, you'll be able to take it from the 6th of November. Okay, so again, it's a very well-defined exam, um, uh, designed super well, with very, very, with really proper tolerances in, in, in this case. Uh, are colleges accepting GMAT focus? Yes, other than um, Harvard and, uh, and, and Wharton for, uh, for their uh, uh, current round two admissions, everyone's admis uh, accepting GMAT focus. Those are the only two schools that I know of uh, that have said, for their round two, they're not going to accept GMAT focus. Okay. All right. Let's come back. So what's your GMAT score governed uh, by? It's governed by your ability to answer difficult questions correctly. Why? Because that's how you go higher in these ability scores. Okay. Um, all right. Now, all of this was theoretical. We, we talked about it. In principle, this is how this should work. I'm now going to share some actual data with you guys okay this is data pre-2018 and uh, because pre-2018 you know the official mocks that you guys uh, take now were, were were called gmat prep mocks and and they provided us excellent insights into into how the gmat actually worked they gave you better than esr reporting uh, um, overall so so these are two students who took the verbal section of the gmat what uh, Howard won't ever accept. No, Howard will accept GMAT focus course. Uh, please, uh, if you can put those questions in the Q&A pod, that'd be good. Uh, they are actually accepting GMAT focus for their 2 plus 2 admissions. 
just in round two. They don't want to confuse our admissions committee. That's why they're not going to accept GMAT focus course. But yeah, next year they will. If you go on their website, read it up, you'd be able to, to see that. Two plus two, if you're applying for that, they'll take the GMAT focus course. Okay. All right. So let's come back over here. Real world data. Verbal section, two students. And you look at these two students, the red rectangles is where people made mistakes. Um, if you look at question number 11 and beyond, there's very, very similar. I mean, both of them made nine mistakes uh, in question numbers 11, from question numbers 11 to 41. The only difference is these two mistakes that student two made in, in questions one and two overall. Let's see the scores that they got. Student one got a V43, which is 97th percentile. At that time, about 200,000 people uh, attempted the GMAT. So the test told him was, hey, my friend, you are among the top 6,000 test takers. Stu uh, student one, that's student one. Student two got a V35, which is 65th percentile. And, and what the test told him was that you are among the top 70,000 test takers over here. Now, I want to ask you, when you look at this data, the difference is two questions. Uh, the difference in ranks is phenomenal. So the question that I want to ask you is, is the GMAT harsh? Okay. Um, or a different way to ask the same question is, is the GMAT forgiving? Is the GMAT harsh or is the GMAT forgiving? Uh, uh, the question that you're asked, answering is, is the GMAT forgiving? So if you say yes, you, what you're really saying is the GMAT is forgiving. If you say no, what you're really saying is no, the GMAT isn't forgiving. All right, let's get a few more responses. I have upwards of 100 students. I only have about 46 responses. So I want to get about uh, 60 responses. All right. 60 responses right there. At the end, the poll broadcast results. About 83% of say the GMAT's not forgiving. Uh, about 17% of you say the GMAT's forgiving. Uh, GMAT's actually a fairly forgiving test. Um, let me kind of look at this. 97 percentile despite 9 out of 41 mistakes. Is that a harsh test? Is that a harsh test? No, not at all. How many of you have, has anyone over here taken taken the GRE or the Indian version or the, the Indian CAT? Has anyone taken the GRE or the Indian CAT? On the CAT or on the GRE, if you make a mistake, can you ever come back by performing better? No. Those are flat tests. Right? There is no way you can come back on, on the GRE or the GMAT. You make a mistake on, on, on certain questions. You know, you made a mistake. Others if others didn't make a mistake. It's going to be, uh, you know, they'll, they'll be better placed than you are. On the GMAT, you can come back, which is why you can get your 97th percentile on verbal despite making nine mistakes. You try doing this on the GRE, make nine mistakes. You know, you're going to be on that 60th percentile mark. There is no way to come back on these tests. Same thing on the CAT. It's very difficult to come back. Okay. Now, why is it? How do we account for these two students? Let's kind of look at... Now, at this point, I want you to remember the hiring piece and how you made decisions and, um, and, and, and the adaptive piece. So student two. Got the first question, median difficulty level. Half the people get that question right. He got that wrong. Got the second question, 30th percentile difficulty level, which means that 70% of the people get that question wrong. Now, those of you who are quant wizards here, what is the probability that a 90th percentile student or the hiring uh, analogy, an EVP candidate, would get an analyst level and a director level question wrong one after the other? Or what's the probability that a 90th percentile student will answer a 50th percentile and a 30th percentile question wrong one after the other? For those of you who are quant wizards, close to zero. It's less than one in 10,000 if you do the exact math. Okay. 
considering a reasonably uh, sized bell curve that's less than one in ten thousand overall. So at this point, the test is not really long to to say, okay, this guy is the most junior junior level guy. Let me serve him a fifteen percentile question. The guy got it right. Then at twenty first, thirtieth, thirty fifth, fortieth. By the time this guy started getting challenging questions, he started making mistakes one again and again. And the test did estimate student two's difficulty level. Um, both these students were EG Math, student one and student two. Uh, this guy ended up getting a V35. This guy ended up getting a V44. Okay. Um, and, and when you think about it, the official mocks did a phenomenal job of estimating their ability. I mean, V32 versus V35 is really, really close. Similarly, V43, V44 is really, really close. So bottom line is, the test is likely to figure out what your ability is. Uh, 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 and, and, and that's what you would get. Don't look at accuracy when it comes to this. Does that make sense? Okay. Focus on building ability and with the same accuracy, your score will improve. Okay. Now the question is, how is the test scored then? And, and that's where you look at your attempt through the lens of ability. V45 is 99 percentile. Um, and, 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 and so when you think about the, the V43 student, these were his ability scores. In SC, he was at 95th percentile. In CR, at a 95th percentile. And in RC, at an 87th percentile. And on, on, on the second guy had these ability scores. Now, when you translate, the, when you combine the difficulty level and the accuracy and get these ability scores, can you see that these ability scores are very different? These students are very, very different students when you look at them through the lens of ability. Don't they look different? 95 versus 81, 95 versus 66, 87 versus 59. And that's how the GMAT evaluates him. It doesn't look at your accuracy. It says, what's my estimated ability of this individual in this area? In the same way, when you hire someone, you really say, what's my estimated ability of this particular individual in the area of leadership? What's my estimated ability of this particular individual in the area of technical prowess? What's my estimated ability of this individual in the area of planning? Okay. So, so that's what they actually do. All right. And it makes sense. Has, has anyone read the book, The Amazon Way? Has anyone read that book? Okay. Um, so if you haven't read it, and what I'm trying to really tell you is the way the GMAT works is the way a lot of successful processes in the world work. So if you ever read the book, The Amazon Way, it has one huge chapter on, on hiring. And, and what Amazon does with regards to hiring, and many of you will experience it post your MBA, is that you go through six to seven rounds of hiring. And each hiring manager has one mandate to evaluate your ability in a certain area. If you do not miss, uh, if you do not meet a minimum threshold, you're not hired. You may meet the threshold in six out of the seven areas, but if you don't meet it in, in one, you're not hired. That's the same way the GMAT works as well. It has these independent vectors that's measuring your ability. And then, you know, based on combining that, you get your end score. Okay. Overall, logical, making sense. And yes, there is no SC uh, in the focus edition. Julian says, when will the EGMAT study plan be updated to GMAT focus? Julian, it's mostly done. If you want to try it out, we have a brand new planner. We spent about 3,000 hours on it. You can write to me at rajat at edasgmat.com. So let me just share that as well. Just write to me and say, I'd like to try out the new planner. Uh, please, can you share the link to me? And we'd be happy to do that. Will we have focus? Today, we don't have focus mocks, but by the end of the month, we will. I mean, if there's one company that's going to come up with a focus uh, prep product, we already have the product out there, but with mocks and call end of the month. And in fact, we'd very soon be starting our call trials for GMAT focus. For those of you who want to be a part of it, be on the lookout for an email. Okay. All right. So let's move forward. Again, the 
regardless of the version of the test you want to take, your score is governed by the ability to answer difficult questions correctly. The way the test evaluates you, the algo doesn't change. Uh, it's just the content that you're evaluated on that changes depending on whether you're taking the focus edition or the current GMAT. So which ability scores does the GMAT uh, evaluate you on? You know, on, on the current GMAT in quant evaluates you on algebra and geometry. Uh, and on the verbal side, you have SCCR and RC. So here are things that you need to, to note. You know, each of these subsections is independent. So prepare for SCCR and RC and quant and algebra geo independently. Make sure you have your target ability scores. Each of these subsections has more or less equal weight. So, so don't think about, hey, RC is more important than SC and, or CR because RC has more questions. No, it has equal weight, more or less, it, to the at least to the second uh, decimal point from what we know. Okay, You will need a target ability. So if you want to get to, uh, uh, let's say, a score of, 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 of 720, there are about uh, uh, 25 ways of, of getting there. And, um, and, 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 and so there's one sweet spot. So for each one of you, there's... A set of good ways so out of those 25 probably five are good paths for you the other 20 are really bad paths for you bad paths means they're going to take longer your likelihood to succeed on that given your starting abilities is is going to be much lower than what it's going to be on those five paths um and 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 also um for each of the quantum verbal scores in in a certain uh combination you have individual paths as well so you need a target ability in each subsection and these are subsections that we are talking about over here Okay. Now, even though all of these are different, four and five are very interesting. How you go about building ability in each subsection, that process is identical, which means when you're starting at a 30th percentile in SC versus you're starting at a 30th percentile in number properties, the steps that you take to go from the 30th to 80th percentile in SC and to do achieve the same improvement in algebra, they're very, very, they're actually identical, not just similar, but they are identical. What you do in stage one, stage two, and stage three, that's identical. And then each one of you has your own strengths and weaknesses, and which means you have uh, the same starting points. Okay. Now, this is for the current GMAT. For GMAT focus, this becomes slightly more complex. The principles still say the same, but the number of paths increase. Why? Because instead of two, you now have three sections. Can anyone guess in how many ways can you go from, if I, if I were to focus on GMAT focus, a 545 to a 675? How many paths exist when you think about the combination of uh, uh, quant, verbal, and DI scores? Any guesses? How many paths exist? I said to 720, there are about 25 paths. From from 675 is like, I think a 730 equivalent. How many paths exist to go from a 545, which is a 600 equivalent, to a 675, which is a 730 equivalent? Guesses? 8,000, okay. A few more? 125, okay. The, the 125 is a reasonably good answer. The, the correct answer is about 240. So you were in the right order of magnitude. There's about 240 paths. So way more paths exist to go from uh, uh, your current score to to uh, to your target score when it comes to GMAT focus. And, and, and that's where, you know, making the right decisions, having a good path is very important and which is something that you'll see come up in the PSP as well. So um, if you are an EG matter, you want to try the PSP out, uh, 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 send me an email. Uh, overall, it will be released to all of you in, in the next um, five to seven days as well. Uh, by the end of next week, we should have it uh, uh, open to everyone. Uh, but if you want to try it out before that, if you're a paid student, definitely let us know. Okay. All right. Where do you get 240 from? Um, each of quant, verbal, and DI has a 60, 90, uh, 90 score. And if you do all the PNCs or permutations, all the combinations, there's no permutations, all the combinations, you're going to really be able to get to it. Okay. So one of the things when you think about GMAT planning, we are here for a, building a GMAT plan that you've got to ask yourself is, when I'm aiming for a certain score, let's say 720 or a 740, what 
ability scores am I aiming for in these areas? How many of you ask this question? What ability scores am I aiming for? Okay. All right, good. And yes, so Jilla passed with the target scores in each section. And yes, you can get your individual PSPs reviewed once you build those. Yes. Okay. All right. So another thing with regards to the GMATs for gaming, here's the P, uh, you know, an ability. Uh, an ESR of a student who improved from a V17 to a V40, you know, a 15th percentile to a 91st percentile. And, and, and you can really see his V40 was composed of 94th percentile in SC, 79th in CR, and 73rd in RC. This is where he, he actually said build, build, improve, improve strategy, where, you know, when the questions were, were medium to medium hard, he got most of those correct. As the questions became harder, he got them wrong. Okay. Again, the takeaway is you can make mistakes and still get a very high GMAT score as long as you make those mistakes on hard question. Okay. Um, and, and again, bottom line is the GMAT is a forgiving test. All right. So I want you to answer these questions overall. So do the first 10 questions matter? Should you approach them differently? Should you spend more time? So each one of these questions is a yes, no. So I want you to write down why, 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 why and why. NNN, NYN. So depending on what your answers to each one of them is, write down that, uh, type them out, press enter. And, and when I have about 30 to 40 responses, I'm going to broadcast results. Let's get a few more answers. I have about 14 answers, about 20 answers. I have about 27, 28 answers. Let's get a few more, guys. Come on. Do the first thing matter? Should you approach them differently? Should you spend more time? Three, two, and one. Let me broadcast results. You can see what people have answered. Y, 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 N, Y, 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 N, Y, N, N, Y, Y, Y again. Okay. Here are my answers. Do the first 10 matter? Absolutely. Should you approach them differently? Absolutely not. That would actually be counterproductive. And should you spend more time? That again would be counterproductive. Okay. All right. Remember this. That test is a forgiving test, A. And B, your GMAT attempt is a reflection of your preparation. How many of you, when you kind of went to take the test, and I know there are a few retakers out here, how many of you actually said, hey, can I squeeze those last 20 points in the last one week? Can I somehow increase my points? Two days before the test, how many of you really say, let me try this slightly different strategy on the test. Maybe I can get those last 10 points. How many of you have done that? before taking the real test, tried something new to, to one little thing that will give you those 10 more points on the real exam. Has anyone done that over here? Doesn't work, yes. Yes, but have you done this? Knew it wouldn't work, but tried, yes. So so what the point that I'm trying to make is, again, your... your um, your, your overall preparation is a reflection of, of who you are, which means in many ways, your score is decided a few days before your preparation. What you can do in, do in the last couple of days is make sure that you definitely get that test. And that's something which is really important. 
Now, my daughter recently took the SAT after 10 days of preparation. It was one of her first attempts. And um, we had estimated her score to be between 1520 and 1530. And we really said, that's what you're going to aim for. You're not going to aim for a 1600 because that's not what your preparation is. You're not going to do anything uh, crazy in the last couple of days. We're just going to focus on making sure you deliver on what you know. What you don't know, you're not going to worry about it. And she got an, a 1520 exactly. Had we tried to do something different, uh, given our experience, she would have gotten a, a 1480. And that's that can very easily happen because 1520 is a 97, 98 percentile. When you are in that high performance zone, any misstep leads to a score reduction. Okay. So what it means is if you are a 90th percentile student, you're a 90th percentile student during your prep. What it means is that you have these stats. Your accuracy in medium level questions is 90%. Your accuracy in hard questions is about 65%. You still make mistakes in one third of hard questions. And that's a 90th percentile student. Remember that. Okay. Now, what happens in the first 10 questions? If the first 10 questions are medium difficulty questions, you're likely to get all of them correct, right? That's who you are. Now, what happens if you try something different? You know, here's what people do. They spend more time. They solve a question. They go back and say, let me check and evaluate every option. When they do that, sometimes they misread stuff. Sometimes they, they overthink. And that's when, even though they have chosen the right option initially, they end up choosing the wrong option. And this is when this accuracy of 90% goes to 75% or 80%. How many of you have done this? Spend more time, double guess yourself, chosen the wrong answer, and then end up getting a, a lower score. Don't do that. You want to perform at par, not below par on the test. Okay. Now, if it so happens that one of the first 10 questions is a hard question because the test might randomly throw a hard question at you, you know, even if you make a mistake on it, that's okay. That's absolutely okay. Think about that interview process. If you threw an EVP level question, as one of the first three questions to a candidate, and you could throw that, do you think that you would evaluate and, and if the person got that question wrong, do you think you would hold that negatively against that individual if it's an EVP level question? No, you won't, right? It's an EVP level question. Not everyone's supposed to get all of those questions right. It is a difficult question. Okay. So, again, make sure that you attempt the test the way you, you, you attempt stuff in practice, all right? If you make a mistake on a hard question, that's okay. The test knows that. Even a 90th percentile student makes mistakes on one of a, a third of the hard questions. Yeah. And then if you do it this way, if you truly are a 90th percentile student, you would get all of those medium questions correct. Okay. All right. Everyone makes mistakes. People like Magdalena, who got a V47, they make mistakes. She got a V48, actually. She made mistakes. This guy got a V47 out of 760. This guy made mistakes. Uh, as long as you express yourself uh, properly, you're going to do really well on the GMAT if your preparation is good. If your preparation isn't good, then there's nothing you can do during the test that can help you get a better score. Okay. So takeaways. Focus on doing the right things. Focus on, on learning. A lot of people study for the test. Uh, and then the, there are those people who focus on learning. If you focus on learning, your studying for the test is going to happen more or less automatically. If you focus on studying for the test, and studying for the test is practicing hundreds and hundreds of questions, hoping that you build ability, you know, then, then you get to a certain point, And beyond that, you flatline. How many of you do that? You study for the test. You practice hundreds and hundreds of questions. The score improved initially, but then you flatlined and said, hey, no matter how many more questions I, 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 I practice, I cannot consistently improve my score. How many of you have seen that? Okay. All right. Focus on building ability. Start loving the test. Okay. Don't change how you approach questions on the real exam. Those are two things that I would really just say. Now, with this, we have a really solid foundation on it. And, and because of that solid foundation, we're going to quickly go through how do you build a study plan? How do you build on, on, on this? 
and and um, and build a solid foundation. Alive says, how do you avoid sloppy mistakes in in the first quarter? You know, uh, like if you're an easy math student, we go through a process called cementing. Right after you you learn the test, uh, you learn the found fundamentals of it. Cementing ensures that you avoid sloppy mistakes. And 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 by the way, there are no sloppy mistakes. There are gaps in process. There are there are um, what I call as bad behaviors. And 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 um, if you penalize yourself for those bad behaviors early on, you fix them. Okay. Does the company ask for a GMAT score in their recruitment process? Consulting firms do. So I was talking to the senior director of of, of recruitment at um, Oxford in, in in February this year. I visited Oxford, um, and, um, and 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 so what he said is, if you want to. You know, Oxford, their their median GMAT score is around a 670, 680 mark. And he says, but he says, he said, if you're looking for consulting, I want to see that seven uh, in front of uh, uh, in front of your uh, uh, GMAT score. If you don't have it, take it again. All right, let's talk about a personalized study plan. And 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 for those of you who are EGMATers who need their study plan reviewed. Please uh, write to to me at rajatari gmat or write to the support email address. They will do that. That's where you can request it. But again, be very specific. Don't just say, "Hey, please, please review my study plan." Be very specific. What questions do you have? Send that information in. The more you tell us, the more the better we can really figure out what is it that you understand and what is it that you don't understand. Accordingly, the more specific our replies can be. Okay. With that. What's the job of a study plan? What is the job of a study plan? Be a bit more specific. It keep, keeps you on track. Systematic prep, okay. Focuses on weakness. All right, that's a better answer. More specific answer. Gives you a direction. That's a good answer. Again, more specific answer. One way to, to think about answering this question is how do you know you have a good study plan? How do you evaluate? Because there are multiple study plans that you can get. How do you evaluate whether you have a good study plan? Tailor to your ability. Okay, that's a good answer. It helps us progress as planned. It should have clear timelines. That's good. Okay. So lots of good answers. So let's kind of understand what how we think about a study plan. Okay. What does a study plan do? For us, it answers three questions. How will you as a student reach your target GMAT score? It gives you clarity as to how much time you need to put in and where do you need to put in over all this time. And, and, and for different subsections within each section, that where changes. So as long as it answers these three questions, uh, then then that's a good study plan. Now, here is something that our study plans don't do, and that they, and no study plan should do that. Our study plans cannot magically invent a way to help you go from score A to score B in a certain amount of time. That's not going to happen. Okay, building ability requires a certain amount of time. A lot of people come to us and say. And I don't know if, if one of those individuals is here, but we get, you know, about 18 to 19 new students a day. And there are people who write to us, and, and a lot of them write to Pyle and I specifically, um, where they say, hey, I have, a, you know, a 5.30, I've been preparing for two months. My deadlines are coming in 45 days. I'm aiming for a 7.50. Can you help me? Has anyone out of this group written an email like this to me? Can you help me build a study plan is more specifically their, their query. Now, a study plan gives you a good direction, but it cannot work up magic. Let me be very, very clear. Okay. So, 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 so we get those questions. We go on there. We answer those questions. And the first thing which is there is, no, you can't get there. You better postpone where, when you apply or you better aim for a, a lower score. Okay. A job of a study plan is to minimize risk. Okay. And to minimize waste, there are two things that we want to do. We want to minimize risk, which means you want to find the most optimal path for you to get to the target score. 
given your starting abilities. And then we want to minimize waste, which means that you should be spending your energy in productive areas. And you're going to see that example when I compare these two study plans. Now, two students, two of our former students, um, Ayush and Rafaela, very, very different starting scores, but very, very similar end score. And they both of them reached their end score. And what you're going to really see is how their study plans are different and how where they spend energy is as different. One of the other things that you will also see is that how following a one month, a two month and a three month study plan or a six month study plan or even a generic study plan is, is incredibly counterproductive. How many of you have seen a one month, two month, three month study plan on the GMAT? Okay. Yeah, you're going to really see why it's super counterproductive to do that. So why, why you end up wasting a ton of your time. Okay. So you build your study plan. This is our old planner. The new planner is, I mean, the old planner is very good. Uh, we built, we released it in 2019 and no one has released something very similar to this or even comparable to this. The new planner is, is two generations ahead of this. Um, so so Rafaela went from a 600 to a 730. Uh, uh, and it took her, I think, about two and a half months to do it, if memory serves me right. So she took a Sigma X mock, which is an EGMAT mocks, and she scored 600 on it. Okay. Now, these were her starting abilities. So one of the things with the Sigma X mock is it gives you your ability scores. These were her starting abilities. What do you make out of these abilities? What are her strengths? What are her weaknesses? Quant's weak. All right. Is there something within Quant that you can really see? Arithmetic is very weak. Yes. RC relatively weak. And CR and NSC are her strengths. Okay. Needs longer prep time for RC and quant. This is, I mean, think about it this way, right? I just gave you these numbers. And then you were able to make these judgments and good inferences. So good judgments, good inferences overall. How many of you have just done in a, even this much for your own preparation? How many of you have gotten your starting abilities in these subsections and accordingly created a rough study plan based on just this data? How many of you have done that? If you're not an EGMAT student. Oh, these are her starting abilities. She's not put in any effort. This is where she was on day zero, day one. Okay. A few of you have done. How many of you have not done? I want to see some no's as well. Those of you who have not done have just started studying. If you've not done this, how did you find these abilities, these starting abilities, if you've not done this? Not yet. Okay. Lots of people don't do it. No and Sigma X mark. You've taken a Sigma X mark, but you've not done this. All right. Okay. Okay, so getting those starting abilities is something which is there. Now, we feed those starting abilities into uh, into, into a score uh, estimator and a score uh, a predictor uh, uh, algo that we have. And these are the target abilities for our 720 that, uh, 730 that, that, that we got. So you can see what it did was it kept the SC and CR abilities to be the same. Why? Because, you know, once you hit that 90th percentile, you don't want to go a lot beyond it unless and until you absolutely have to. Because... You get into slippery, slippery slope over there. Then it says, okay, to get to her target verbal score, let's improve her RC to 85th percentile, which should be very possible. Why? Because SC and CR and RC, they, they share the core skills. So if she's good in SC and CR, it's going to be easier for her to, to get to, to RC. Now, an algebra geometry, given, you know, given the fact that verbal was a strength, she was aiming for a V33, V43, V44. Uh, she didn't need a Q50 to get to a 730 or Q48, Q47 would have done. So, so let's improve her algebra geometry first. Why? Because she's stronger in it. She's much stronger in it. At a 49th percentile ability means that she knows, you know, majority of the concepts, but application is where she, she, she has problems. She has to learn some concepts, but she has to learn a lot of application. But a 15th percentile in arithmetic, which is what was here, means that she has to learn concepts and then she has to learn application. So that's why let's not try and, and push her too hard in arithmetic. Let's push her in algebra geometry. And that's when it did that. When it applied that logic, 
worked on the math because we have data of upwards of 10,000 ESRs. These were the ability scores that it came uh, and the target ability scores for her for arithmetic and algebra geometry. So you can really see she's not aiming to be the best in arithmetic, but in algebra geometry, she, she should solve a, a significant number of hard questions with, with 60 to 70% accuracy. Okay. Logically, does that make sense? Okay. And you can also see right on day zero, this is there's a lot of good decisions that we are able to take because you have this 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 algo behind you. Okay. And that's why it's really important to be strategic about these decisions. Now you really say, okay, I know my starting abilities, I know my target abilities. I have a certain time. Where should I be spending this time overall? So that's where you know by looking at data uh, of about thousands and thousands of students we were able to figure out to go from a certain ability group, let's say you're less than 30th percentile to an 80th percentile ability group, or you're between 30th to 50th percentile to an 80th percentile ability group, how much time you're going to take. So in the EGMAT world, we go through, a, through three stages of learning to get to a certain ability. Your first stage of learning is when you learn concepts and application, which is where, um, which we call as if you think about, if you've heard over the EGMAT SC course, CR course, and number properties course, these are our core courses. Once you've gone through these courses, you don't go from SA to CR right away. You've got to demonstrate to us that you can master that application, that you achieve, certain, achieve a certain ability in, in medium and hard questions. And this is where this process comes in. Easy matters. What do we call this process, mastering application? What is stage two called? EG matters. Cementing, yes, we call these cementers. It's a very specific process you've got to go through. There's a very specific set of quizzes you have to do. There are thresholds you have to meet. Once you meet those thresholds, you're good to go from SC to RC, SC to number properties, SC to, uh, uh, to algebra or, or to CR. You will not forget your concepts in SC once you uh, hit the thresholds in cementing. And then... Uh, for those of you aiming for that 90th percentile, you go through that refinement step. This is where you, you move to a Scholarium platform. You take custom quizzes after identifying your weakness using analytics and then fix those weaknesses. And once you fix those weaknesses, you get to that 90th, 95th percentile. So stage one, if you do it well, a bare minimum 55th percentile is what you get to. Stage two, if you do well, a bare minimum 70th percentile that yeah, you get to that. And then stage three. If you do it well, you can get to a 90th percentile or even higher, depending on the metrics that you are aiming for. Okay. So, so, so that's something which is which is really there. RD says, if I miss some starting days due to over time, what would the, what would be the best strategy to ensure my PSP is still on track? RD, um, the way I would really do this is um, it's, it's essentially finish the subsection that you were on, um, and that's a great question by the way that you asked. Make sure you do you hit your you finish your cementing and then go back and replan. Um, that's one way. The second way would be because you can replan your PSP. The second way would would actually be that uh, that that uh, you you study put in more hours more hours than what you put in over there and 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 catch up. Okay. All right. Now with that, we also generate time estimates. So so so. These are areas where you see the tick, which means that you have innate ability, you need not study this. And you see this over here, which means this is an area where you need to build ability. You, you need to study this. And this legend means that, hey, you, you're not gonna, you're not aiming for such, such a high ability that you need to spend time on this stage, okay? So these were the data points for, um, for Rafaela, where in SCCR, you know, she already had the ability. All she had needed to do was maintain her ability and then in RC, because of her low ability, this is what she needed to get to. And arithmetic and algebra, you can really see she's aiming for a higher ability in algebra. So she needed to refine to perfection. But in arithmetic, since she was not aiming for anything above 70th percentile, till master application is all that, that she needed to do. Okay. Um, Ayush. On the other hand, very different student. She came to us after his first two attempts. He couldn't improve. Columbia told him he actually got through an interview around with Columbia, but they told him your score wasn't enough. He needed to improve his score. Um, uh, and so he had a 670 with a Q50 and a V31. Okay. And um, and, and uh, he needed to get to a 750. He actually got to a 750 with these metrics overall. 
Okay, good questions. Let's go through our use. Let me answer those questions because they're in context questions. So we asked him to take a mock again because his, when he came to us, his last EMR attempt was a, a month or so back, but he's repeated his 670. These were his starting abilities. Clearly, SC and CR were the areas he needed to work on. RC was, was a pretty decent strength for him. So we, we got the target abilities in SC and CR. We maximized his score improvement in RC where he went from, uh, his goal was to go to that 90th per, 93rd percentile from that 80th percentile. And arithmetic, we said, hey, let's maintain this. You have a Q50. Let's not worry about a Q51. Okay. So this is what his PSP looked like. Sorry about this. Um, so again, he pretty much had everything uh, for him in uh, arithmetic and algebra. These were ticks too. Over here, all he had it needed to was maintain, but in CR and RC, he needed to do everything. That's something that he needed to do. Uh, CR and SC, I'm sorry. In RC, we had him go through cementing just because we wanted to make sure he maximized his, pro uh, his learning. So he said, don't worry about doing the course. Let's go through the cementing process and then move forward overall. Okay. Uh, but, and again, the key thing over here is when you think about Two different individuals aiming for a 730 versus a 750. Their needs are different. Their learning content is different. Their time estimates are very different. In SC, Ayush had to spend 2.7 weeks. This is dedicated effort, about 20 hours a week. So we're talking about 50 hours overall or more. Um, in, in CR, he had to spend close to 40 hours. Rafaela only spent 15 hours combined in SC and CR. In Quant, this guy spent close to 10 hours combined. Rafaela spent close to 40 hours uh, each in arithmetic and in algebra. In RC, Rafaela spent a lot more time than I used it. Okay. Again, so very similar target scores, but very different needs, very different uh, focus areas. And, and accordingly, the time spent in these areas was very, very different. The starting points ensured that they started from very, very different things. I used primarily went in scholarly new when it came to arithmetic and algebra. Rafaela had to start from basics in these places. Rafaela primarily spent her time in Scholarium. Uh, Ayush had to start from basics in, in SC, and he had to actually do basics and master application in CR. Okay. All right. Now I can take some questions that are there. Okay. Um, question in the Q&A pod. On what interval should I plan on taking ability quizzes and mocks to track my progress along with cementing? Uh, good question, uh, Sharia. So, so if you're taking cementing quizzes, you really don't need to take ability quizzes and mocks. Please take only during the, the last stage of your preparation. If you're really worried about forgetting something, you know, custom quizzes and scholarium are, are a wonderful way to really evaluate yourself. Because remember, custom quizzes give you weighted scores, and and that can be a really good translation to to an estimate of your ability. Okay. Uh, the punk says not a current student, but pondering is a Sigma X mock specific to GMAT focus as a normal Sigma X mock won't be relevant to someone taking focus. Now today, the punks or Sigma X mock is not, uh, we don't have Sigma X mocks for GMAT focus. We're still about 30 days away from those. Uh, so, so I would recommend taking an official mock. If you Google how to take a GMAT focus official mock, you'll see a video by me. Um, and, and, and you can take that and, and you can come up with ability scores and put them in the GMAT planner and it will tell you how to go about your preparation. Okay. Jagrati says, if I stand at a 65th percentile ability at the starting point in a particular area, does it mean that I need not spend my time learning basics? Jagrati, great question. And, and more or less, yes. The answer to that is yes. If you had a 65th percentile ability, if you were an EG matter, I'd start you with cementing. And then as you go through the three medium and three hard cementing quizzes, we'd figure out which specific weaknesses uh, you have. And we, we would... We may then ask you to go back to the course just in those areas. The, the reason, one of the, the best things about the GMAT course is its modularity and then the trackability within that modularity. And then so that once we identify those weaknesses um, in the, those, those very spe specific weaknesses, uh, we can then direct you to, to, to individual learning activities and then we can address those weaknesses as well. Yes. On the quant side, it works even more beautifully because the quant course is what we call a space enabled. Pace is a personalized adaptive course engine. So when you start the quant course, regardless of your starting ability, uh, it con evaluates what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, and it builds a custom course for you. So in quant, you don't need to worry about it. Very soon in DI, you won't need to worry about it. Uh, but, but in verbal, 
even today if you do that anything in di or or um, or, or in, in verbal we can still customize your course based on on your scholarly name stats Hunar says, um, uh, can you explain in detail what are things to improve accuracy if I've studied all and done a couple of questions but didn't get too much improvement? Hunar, if you remember this, the GMAT's not, uh, you know, about remembering information. It's about being able to apply. So if you're not able to improve and you say, hey, I know all the concepts, you really don't know how to apply concepts. And we're going to see an example of it uh, fairly soon. So figure out what behaviors are causing you to make mistakes. Fix those behaviors if you really think you know the concepts. Okay, uh, but but again, we'll 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 show this with evidence. Let's just go over here. Uh, Akshay, I don't have your doubts here. I'm, I looked at the Q and A pod, so so please put in your doubts. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, Shrey says, I'm about to start my prep tomorrow, Pete Vasek, Mike's mock, Q50, V33. To start with stage 2 and SC and RC, is that the right approach? If your ability is high, then yes, that would be the right approach. Again, take the cementing quizzes. That will confirm your ability. If you falter in hard cementing, write to us and we'll customize your, your preparation. Absolutely. Okay. So, Shrey, hopefully that answers your question. How accurate is the Sigma X mock in reflecting the actual result? I will tell you it's more accurate than um, than the official mocks. Okay. So um, Lucas says if an EG matter, perform the Sigma X, I've put my inputs on the study plan, would benefit from sending it to uh, to you for review. Again, if if you want it, Lucas, I'd be happy to review it. I'd recommend uh, you either write an email or record a Loom video and, and send them to me. So that way it's easier for me to review and I can give in my comments. Besides taking courses in, in eGMAT, is it wise to study official books or GMAT advanced questions? Please don't. Don't study anything else. Okay. Let me just put some context, put some stuff in context. So when you think about the eGMAT CR course, and this is just a CR course, not cementing, not scholarium, just the core course, stage one that we're talking about. It has close to 400 questions and examples. If you look at the next most comprehensive resource out there, which again is not audiovisual, but just a textbook, and has the Manhattan GMAT book. It has 127 questions. That's how comprehensive each GMAT resources are. Okay, you don't need to do anything else. How do you choose between the legacy and GMAT focus? Let's ask this question towards the end. Mohit says, I'm work, I've worked six days. I'm able to manage three hours on weekdays and four to five hours on Sundays. It's okay to do one day off. Yes. Um, uh, short answer, Mohit. Yes, it's okay to do one, uh, take one day off. I would recommend taking that one day off. So if you're, since you're an EG matter, if you are an EG matter, I'm assuming that. So if you're an EG matter, between modules, you can take a day off. That's absolutely okay. And then during your day off, please revise your notes. Um, but but don't you know uh, uh, take a day off when when you are within a module, especially you know if you've gone through the concept files but haven't done the application files. But yes, after you've gone through a module, take a day off. That's absolutely okay. And then come refreshed. All of us need to refresh, and I, we do understand that. But but again, use that modular architecture. Uh, Overall, Lucas, uh, your problem right to the support team. They'll help you answer that question. All right. Can I take an EGMAT mock if I'm not a student? Yes, you can take a Sigma X mock. Just Google Sigma X mock. We'd be able to get that. I usually end up with 80 to 90% in the practice quiz score. Should you go through the whole stage one before moving to cementing? If your initial score ability estimate is low, then yes. Yes, sir. And, and that's okay. It's good that you're getting 80 to 90% in practice quizzes. You're supposed to get a threshold in practice quizzes within the EGMAT courses 80%.
age of Ayush when he when he took the GMAR was 28, if I remember correctly. So he's in that 28 bracket. Okay. Okay, guys, GMAT focus versus the current GMAT we're going to really talk about later on, please. All right. So, here's something else that I want to talk about. Uh, what is it that that, that 740 plus or, or, or that 685 or a 675 on the focus edition can do? Now, a lot of people will tell you that your GMAT's not an end all. Uh, and that's true. You know, just your GMAT score doesn't really help you get into your school of your choice. Uh, but but how much does your score actually help? And, and to do that, in 2021, we we actually uh, did a survey of about 600 of our students. Each one of them had scored between 690 to 780, if memory serves me right. Um, and, and the goal really was to get enough students in each bracket so that we have a statistically significant data point. Okay, And, and to, to usually get a statistically significant data point, you need about 50 to 60 students in, in each group. Uh, at least you wanted to get about a one, uh, 120, 130 students or so in each group or so, and which is where uh, you could repeat your results and you can say, okay, what is my what are my inferences out of the first 60 and, and have those remains, uh, inferences remain more or less the same when we add another 60 data points to this. Okay. So we looked at people who are in that 700 to 730 bracket, compared those to 740 plus bracket and we looked at people who are out of these who applied to m7 schools okay that's really important this is not just about how many of them got an admit based on blank data but we looked at did you apply to m7 schools and then did you get accepted to them and what we found was yes you know uh one thing is m7 is magnificent seven so you're talking about uh, uh harvard stanford wharton uh booth um uh, uh columbia tuck um, and I oh, forget which is the seventh one. Um, Kellogg, sorry. Okay, so instead of Ivy League, you, a lot of you have heard of Ivy League. In, in in the MBA world, we talk about M7, Magnificent Seven. These are you know the most coveted seven schools that people go for. Doesn't mean schools outside of them are. Uh, there's anything wrong with them. Let me be very clear. I mean, Ross is a fantastic school. Yale is a fantastic university. Anderson, I, I, I respect them. Uh, respect Anderson a lot. So, so there are some really good universities out there. Darden's a fabulous school as well. But but M7 is, is, is kind of the coveted seven schools that are out there. Okay. And what we found when we looked at this was that, you know, when you get a 740 plus score, very, very similar backgrounds, your chances of getting to an M7 school were about 28%. So not everyone gets in there, but but about third, one third of students or um, slightly less than one third of students get there. But if you're in that 710 to 700 to 730 bracket, you have a 13% chance of getting into an M7 school. Okay. Which, again, if you think about it, your, your chances multiply, they double. And, and if there's anything that I could do to double my chances, I would do it, especially if it's in my control. Especially if, you know, if you're in this bracket and this is about 50 hours of more work to go from a 700 to 730 to a 740 plus. Okay. These are for MBA, primarily for MBA. We did not do a whole lot for masters. Masters, the bracket is slightly lower. Okay. Uh, thank you. That's a good question. Another thing which we were very concerned about was scholarships. And, and I'm a sucker for scholarships. When I did my MBA, I had two full rides. And um, and, and and so I didn't pay a single penny for my MBA. So And, and we've EG Matters got about $40 million worth of scholarship every year. So so this is something um, that that uh, we found as well. So when it comes to 740 plus scorers, but about... 45% of M7 admits receive scholarships. So, you, you know, after the admit, you you people schools look at you for scholarships, and these are purely merit-based scholarships, at least most of them, and uh, which means that even though you may be super rich, if you qualify for it based on merit, they will give you a scholarship. 82% of T20, which means outside of M7, these two are mutually exclusive groups, uh, got scholarships, which is phenomenal. I mean, if there's one reason to, to get a 740 or higher score, that is essentially this okay you want to get scholarships you do want to pay less for your for my mba okay the other thing that we did was and this was one of the most challenging things to do to really say hey let's kind of divide people who have that 730 740 not 720 not 710 but but 730 and 740 and then those who have 760 or higher and um and, and, and so what's the delta in scholarships and and this is was the hardest thing we really had to get a statistically significant number of people in each of these groups. But what we found was that the delta between these 20 points is about $35,000 overall. 
ke. Now, this translated in many ways. One is there were people who were in this group who got into an M7 school and got a $40,000 scholarship. And then there were people in this group, which is 760 or higher, who applied to a T20 school and got a full ride. And, and so people leverage those 760 scores in two ways. Okay. So, 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 but again, if you think you can get to a 740 reasonably easily, please, please spend that time to get a 760. It will be tremendously helpful when it comes to scholarships. Okay. 740 plus includes 760 as well. Yes, the 740 plus these over here uh, include 760 as well. So this is everything above 760. Uh, sorry, over here. This is everything on top. Yes, that's why it's 740 plus. Okay. Uh, you can write to me at rajat at e gmail.com. You can look me up on LinkedIn, connect with me on LinkedIn as well. That will be another way for you to connect with any top student uh, or most top students. Uh, most students at top business schools. There are some examples. These are fairly old examples. We need to update those. But again, they'll give you the essence of it. Uh, Victor got a 770. He got multiple full rides. Uh, he spent about a thousand bucks on his on his preparation. And he got about 350k of total scholarship uh, uh, money. Okay. Kong Bui. Uh, and, and the reason I give his example, even though he went to Ohio Fisher, is, is that when you think about it, when you watch his interview over here, he, this guy had a fairly average profile, but he executed on his plans beautifully and 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 um, and, and got a tremendous uh, scholarship. He got, he got a full fellowship from, from Ohio Fisher, um, and 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 which actually not just waived off every penny that he had to pay, but it also paid him seventeen hundred dollars a month as stipend. And, and Ohio Fisher has this wonderful scholarship program that does that. We send about two students to, to Ohio Fisher who get this fellowship every year. And this is, you know, you get money in your pocket to do this. Trust me, uh, there's nothing better than this. Okay. Um, he got four full rides in addition to that as well. So overall, about half a million dollars worth of scholarship money. Again, his English was imperfect. And as you watch his interviews, English is way better now. But as you watch his interviews, English was imperfect. He didn't have any extracurriculars. Uh, but one thing that you'd also realize from his interview is he executed beautifully. He knew how to prepare for the interview. He knew how to prepare for the GMAT. He knew his strengths. He knew his weaknesses. He was very focused. He did not deviate from his plan. He did not apply to a lot of uh, top schools because he said, that's not what I'm looking for. And he, uh, last I checked, he's a beautiful corporate job at Dell. Okay. One of our other students who, who got a 750 got about $180,000 in um, in total scholarships uh, overall. Okay, and, and Akansha is currently studying at Wharton. And if you go to our Edmondson Scholarships page, you can see a lot of these scholarship journeys, uh, about $10 million worth um, overall. Uh, you can see I usually over here. You can watch his GMAT journey and his scholarship journey. So this guy who was waitlisted by Columbia, once he improved his, um, his GMAT score, in round three, he actually submitted his GMAT score. Um, uh, he already had a waitlist, so so they not only converted his waitlist, they actually gave him 50k overall. Um, and and think about um, you know going from a waitlist to to an admit with scholarship. Okay, and essentially we can get this data because we have students who get to these scores. You know, if you look at GMAT Club and then you look at um, uh, 700 plus scores and GMAT Club does a phenomenal job of organizing these scores chronologically. So you can look at eGMAT, look at in the last three months how many 700 plus scores have our students reported, how many 700 scores have you know Manhattan GMATs or Magooshes or Target Test Prep students reported. And what you're going to conclude is 60% of all 700 plus scores uh, are reported by eGMAT as everyone else combined is, is about 40%. Okay. Um, also, a lot of people know us for our verbal scores. What you don't realize is that since we released our new quant course, about uh, we account for about 70% of all Q49 or higher scores. Okay. Um, and when it comes to five-star reviews, this number is going to be very close to, uh, it's probably very close to 2,000 to right now. Okay. All right. All um, right. Do scholarships decrease with each round? Round one and round two, in my experience, because we get data from our students, 
more or less the same amount of scholarship money. There's really no difference between uh, that and round one and round two. I've also seen people get 70-80% scholarships in round three as well. Okay. Can a good GMAT score remedy uh, a low GPA? Absolutely. But again, we've got to remember what GPA represents. GPA represents two things. One is your ability to take on the academ academic rigor. The second is, is your regularity. Now, your GMAT score proves your ability to take on, you know, the academic coursework. Uh, it also tells you how sharp, it tells the school how sharp you are. And if you have good work X where, and, and glowing LORs where you show consistency in your job, then your GPA has, your low GPA has, is irrelevant overall. How significant is the difference between a 730 and a 740 in, in the admissions process? Uh, it depends on how many people are when you have very similar uh, leadership based achievements to yours. If not many people have, if your profile is fairly unique, then not a whole lot. If your profile is above average, but not fairly unique, so I'll kind of divide your profile into these these brackets, then, then it could make a, a significant difference. Is MIM good uh, if I'm in the last year of graduation or should I wait for two more years to do an MBA? Um, good question. Uh, I, I think it depends on what your ultimate goals are. If you want to work in the area of management, right, out, out of your out of college, and MIM is fairly fairly good. An MBA gives you slightly better skills and then, uh, so, so it just completely depends on, on what you want to do. If you want to, for example, if you want to work in the area of analytics, an MIM would do a fabulous job but it won't teach you leadership it won't teach you the multi um, the overall it won't give you the overall picture that an mba gives you but it'll teach you leadership it'll, it'll teach you analytics it'll teach you the business side of how analytics are used uh and as well as the technical side of it so so yeah it's a really good choice um and then two years down the line three years down the line you can really decide do you really need an mba or have you gathered those skills by working in the organization that you have and taking up leadership courses or you know you want to go for an MBA, or you want to just continue the path that you are on, and then go in for an executive MBA. Okay. Okay. So, what have we learned so far? That's we've learned why you need a high score. We've need, talked about the PSP. We've talked about why the, how the GMAT is a test of ability and how do you go about building ability. Let's talk about how do you execute on this? You have a plan. It's personalized to your needs. You have clarity on how much time you're going to spend on each stage of learning. So why is it that all of us don't get to uh, a, a 90th percentile or, or a 720? Why 720 is still a 95th percentile or a 94th percentile to be more precise or why do people get stuck in that 60th percentile why do people still get uh, stay stuck at uh, remain stuck at, 50, at 60th percentile what happens tell me guys what do you think happens why doesn't everyone improve to the 90th percentile? Skipping courses stages, that's one good answer, yes. Seems to come with experience, I guess. Competition, now competition isn't usually the case. Let me just be very clear. What else? The mending of concepts, lack of direction, hitting the roof in terms of capability. Now, capability, let me just be very clear. Most people are very capable. I think the GMAT is not rocket science. Okay. You're not talking about, you know, a ton of concepts. It's not the same as acing, uh, you know, the IIT. Um, uh, although in some ways the application part is, is slightly more, but but it's not as complex as that. Okay. So most of you are capable enough, not well prepared for perfection of skills. Yes, that's the output. The question is, why does this happen? Okay. So so that's something that that uh, 
not really. So let me just go into into this, and 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 this is something which is not only in the case of GMAT, uh, but also in the case of other exams. The reasons why pe some people achieve greatness and others don't is 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 because of what we're going to talk about over here, and you're going to realize this. So let's talk about sixtieth percentile, and I'm going to take in as you know, that's as even two hundred thousand people take the GMAT every year, which is what it used to be a few years back. We're going to talk just about the sentence correction section. Uh, although those of you studying the GMAT focus, that's not relevant to you, but the reasons remain the same. Okay. So what it means is someone who's at a 60th percentile, their ability is this is you know is that person is at the top is among the top 80,000 students out there. In SC, that person has spent about 40 hours learning. Uh, starting ability is 30th percentile. And there's another student who's at the 90th percentile, which means among the top 20,000 students, same 40 hours learning. So it's not that this person has spent more hours over here. S identical starting ability and the capability is very, very similar. Okay. Why is it that one was able to achieve perfection and the other wasn't? It's about your outlook towards learning. Cutting corners and building ability is what I'm going to translate over here. And the person who said that is, um, is actually absolutely correct. So a 60th percentile student prepares for the exam. The attitude is exam preparation. Their attitude is kind of figure out how do I get this kind of question right. For them, when they study, acing the sentence correction part is about learning the major error types. And, 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 and just if you have that knowledge of error types, what they really see is I'm going to vertically scan through the answer choices, figure out what the differences are based on my knowledge of conceptual knowledge. I'm going to figure out which usage, which usage is correct, which usage is not. And, and, and then um, if I can't figure it out, I might use meaning to really figure this out. For them, they quickly learn the concept. So they, they basically spend 30% of their time learning. Remember the same 40 hours and 70% of their time practicing questions. How many people associate themselves with this particular guy how many people say hey my prep is, my prep looks like this this is how i'm preparing for sc or this is how i'm, how I'm preparing for data insights whether it's two part analysis whether it's msr or rc or cr okay this is not the right way to prepare the gmat's not a test of your ability to identify errors in concepts a 90th percentile student understands that there are about 200 major sentence structures that are evaluated on the GMAT. And these sentence structures com are combined together to communicate a certain meaning effectively. And, and so they figure out how is it that these sentence structures can be used properly and how is it that these sentence structures can be used incorrectly. And, and, and they, ident they figure out how, when used incorrectly, they express the wrong meaning. So for them, meaning is the primary way of, of, of solving questions. They, they understand the meaning that the author intends to communicate and then they focus on uh, on applying that method to solve every question. For them, meaning is not one of the other error types. It's the way to solve questions. Uh, they get a lot more feedback during learning. Why? Because they have to master these sentence structures. They spend about 60% of their time learning and as a result, once they've done, once they're done learning, they spend need only 40 percent of the they need to spend only 40 percent of their time practicing questions now during learning because they need this feedback okay they spend a lot of their time uh, 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 they solve a lot of questions as well but these are very very specific questions over here but then once they're done with the cementing and and uh, and test readiness it's just 40 percent of their time overall what splits? Splits is looking through the answer choices vertically and, and really scanning through them and seeing the difference. So that's the split. The difference is, the split is, is called splits. That's another way name for, uh, for differences. Okay. So what's, what's a parallel for CR? Okay. In CR, a lot of people really look at strength and weaken, uh, evaluate assumption as, as different error types. They focus on learning that, which again is important to learn. In the same way, you, you, it's, it's really important to, to, to learn SV verbs, pronoun. That's there. You've got to learn those. But that's not what the test is evaluating you on. Not just that. That's one of the, the subcomponents. What the test evaluates you on in CR is the ability to visualize information, the ability to really build that logical structure. And, and when you think about async CR, that's what you need to, to build on. If you have, if you can visualize information, if you can build logical structures, 
then regardless of the question type, you'd be able to answer CR questions with a lot of precision. Does that help you? CR is not daunting. CR is simply about visualizing information. Okay, attend the CR session next week. Okay, so what does it mean when it comes to, to, to answering questions using the meaning-based approach? Let's illustrate that with one simple question. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to give you uh, uh, an SC question. And, and because I don't want to time you guys on this, I want you to select still solving over here. I want 30 people to select still solving. And that way, when you choose an option other than still solving, I will know um, 30 people to select still solving before I show, show, show the question. I have 20. Let's get you 25, guys, still solving. So that way, when you choose an option other than still solving, I know you guys are done. Okay, I'm going to remove broadcast results. Here is the question. Solve this question the way, you know, you solve an SC question. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, you have your time. All right, about 70% of you are done. You guys have another 20 seconds. All right, three, two, and one. Let me end the poll. The broadcast results. This is how you guys poll. Choice C is really popular. Choice D is very popular. Choice E is quite popular as well. A and B are not popular at all. A is 
not popular at all. B is somewhat popular. Five students still chose choice B. All right, so let's let's go through this. I'm going to hide this. Let's look at this. I'm going to bring in my short answer part here. So how was this question? How did you feel while well, well, choosing the answer, while well, evaluating the, the question stem? Fairly easy, medium, OK. You guessed an easy question, medium hard. All right, medium, OK. All right, so let's talk about splits. When you think about this, you know, completely underlined sentence, usually splits don't work in such questions, and which is why I wanted to force you to think about um, uh, about meaning in this case. So you see there are multiple beginnings. You have the church joined. The church joined in choices A. Let's bring back my annotation here. Uh, in, in, in choices A and D, uh, you have while, while over here. You have this weird thing over here. You have but in... So you have a contrast word in four of them. There's no contrast word in choice C. So in it, And there are other differences as well. So when you think about just purely the splits part of it, um, you know, it doesn't seem to work uh, in this case. And 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 so um, so so that's something where where uh, the, the the splits piece is not as 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 great uh, over here. So you've got to use the meaning based approach in in this case. So let's kind of see how we go about using the meaning-based approach. So one of the first things which is really important with regards to the meaning-based approach is to really find out without worrying about the errors in the original sentence, what's the job that the author wants to do um, from the sentence? What's the goal? What's, what information does, does the author want to communicate? And you do that by strategically pausing at various points and, and, and breaking the, the sentence down into its sentence structure. So let's kind of do that. This is what we've done over here. The church coined the date February 14th as Valentine's Day. Why? With an ulterior motive to do something. What? To Christianize the pagan celebration of Lupercalia. That aspect is claimed by a few experts. But then there's a contrast word. But over here, the author says, it is celebrated on this day to honor the val Valentine's death burial. That is the more prevalent belief. So in many ways, what the author wants to really say is he wants to communicate two claims about why February 14th is celebrated as Valentine's Day. And says, hey, claim one is by the church and with an ulterior motive. Claim two is to honor the anniversary of Valentine's death or burial. Claim one is made by uh, uh, by a few experts. They really say the church did it. Claim two is what the general belief is overall. These are the three aspects that the author wants to communicate through the original sentence. How many of you uh, were able to get all three or if there was a certain aspect that you missed. You should mark which one of these aspects did you not identify while selecting the answer choices. And this is a multiple response question. So you can say, hey, I wasn't able to, to if you if you fail to, to identify aspect three, you can just choose three. If you fail to identify aspects one and three, you can choose both one and three. If you fail to identify aspects two and three, you can choose those. So you identified all of those. You kept those into mind while choosing your answer choice. Then don't select any option. And you can really see there's no conceptual error over here. It's just a behavioral issue that may have caused you to make a mistake uh, in, in a question such as this one. Okay. All right. If you were able to identify all three, most likely you should have gotten the correct answer. Um, you know, uh, if you were unable to identify either one of these aspects, then this is a skill set you need to build. All right. So with that, Let's kind of analyze what are the errors over there. And this is the way we go about doing this. Let's first identify the uh, the uh, the meaning, the intended meaning from uh, from the sentence, and then go on to um, to find the errors. Okay. So when you look at this, I'm going to briefly go through this. I'm not going to explain a whole lot of this because this is not an SC session. You have a bunch of subject verb pairs, but then you have these dangling verbs that have no subjects. Is claim doesn't have a subject. Uh, and is over here also doesn't have a subject. And that's why you have two SV errors and which is why the original sentence is wrong. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we know the meaning that the, the, the sentence wants to communicate. We know the errors in the original sentence. Now we're going to go choice by choice, identify the error. This is choice B. This is choice B over here. This is your original choice and these are 
the aspects of meaning that you have in one, two, and three. Let's read choice B. Choice B says, while with an ulterior motive to Christianize the pagan celebration of Lupercalia, a few experts do claim. So as per this choice, this ulterior motive A belongs to these few experts. So A belongs to the few experts. As per my original uh, uh, sentence, uh, the motive belonged to the church. This changes the meaning, hence choice B is wrong. People who chose choice B, 10 people who chose choice B, can you see where you made a mistake? 10 folks who chose choice B, how it changes the meaning. As per the original sentence, who had the ulterior motive? This is your original sentence. The original sentence says, the church coined the date February 14th with an ulterior motive to Christianize the pagan celebration of Lupercalia. So who had the ulterior motive as per choice A or the original sentence or as per the author's intent? Who had the ulterior motive? The church. As per choice B, with while with an ulterior motive to Christianize the pagan celebration of Lupercalia, a few experts do claim. Who has the ulterior motive? A few experts. Is that correct? Nope. Which is why choice B is wrong. There's no, nothing grammatically wrong about it. It's just that it communicates the incorrect meaning. Does the original sen sentence always have the, the correct meaning? It always communicates the right meaning. And in, in some cases where, where the meaning isn't apparently clear, you have to infer the meaning. But the meaning is always there in choice A. In fact, if you attend RSC session or watch the recording, you'd be able to see the two categories of questions that are there. 80% of your questions is, are where you can get the meaning right away fairly easily. The other 20%, you have to infer the meaning, but we also teach you how to go about inferring the meaning. Okay. All right, people who chose choice B, is that clear? People who chose choice B. Now let's talk about choice C. Choice C is the most popular answer choice. Let's go over here. This is how you guys polled over here. 31% of the class chose choice C. Okay. Choice C says, while a few experts claim that the church coined it, blah, 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 as uh, with an ulterior motive for Krishna, the pagan celebration of Perkelia. So the first part, absolutely okay. Their more prevalent belief is, who does their refer to here? Who does this word there refer to? A few experts. As per the original sentence, claim to belongs to, in general, the population, not the same group of experts. Okay? So, changes the meaning. Beautiful. The sentence structure is beautiful. Grammatically, it reads just right. But, it changes the meaning drastically and hence, is not the correct sentence. People who chose choice C, you can see you did not focus on the meaning that the sentence wanted to communicate. Hence, even though you knew the grammar, you corrected the grammar when there's no grammatical error in choice C, you made a mistake. Okay. Choice D, D for delta, is the only choice that's difficult to reject. It's not the correct option. The only choice that's a bit more challenging uh, uh, to overall to reject. Okay, Choice D says, uh, and I'm going to focus on this word, as claimed by a few experts. So we're going to really look at this over here. We're going to take a simple sentence. Apple is the market leader as claimed by, by Forbes magazine. In this case, are you communicating information, A, and are you making a claim? You're merely communicating information. You're not making a claim. And which means that if it turns out that Apple is not the market leader or a market leader, depending on, uh, so in this case, the, so it should be the over here, then you should not be blamed. Is that clear to everyone? Right? Okay. You're merely passing on information over here. Now, if it turns out that Forbes magazine did not say this, then you are to blame. But if Forbes magazine said this, and it turns out that Apple is not the market leader, then you know you don't 
you don't share the burden of blame because you merely communicated this piece of information. Let's look at this over here. Apple is the market leader as claimed by Forbes magazine. In this case, you are communicating information. You are making a claim here because you're backing Forbes claim. You're saying, hey, Forbes said that and I'm agreeing with it. Apple is the market leader as claimed by Forbes magazine. Uh, and, and, and you share equal blame if it turns out that Apple is not the market leader. Okay. You can see the difference in meaning here with is versus as. Can you see the difference in meaning in is versus as? Okay. Really important. Now, and this is something that's tested day in and day out in RC. Okay. An inference question, and you can infer only what the author believes in, not what the author is merely listing as a piece of communication. Okay. And, and that's something that that you yeah, inference questions will test you day in and day out. In choice D, when you look at the original choice, the author is merely communicating information. The church coined coin February 14th as Valentine's Day is claimed by a few experts. The author use is claimed, which means the author is saying, hey, I'm not saying that. I'm merely communicating this information. Okay. But when you look at choice T, we're talking about as claimed by a few experts, which means the author is backing that claim overall. Same thing with the second choice. But it is celebrated on this date to blah, 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 is the more prevalent belief. Okay. Uh, this also is where the author is merely mentioning information, but over here uh, uh, is, is also where the, the author says, but its celebration on this date is to honor the anniversary of Valentine's Day or burial. The author is backing that claim as well. In both cases, the author backs this claim and, and because of which choice D is wrong. Okay. Let's look at our correct answer choice C. Choice E says that the church coined the date February 14, blah, 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 is claimed. So it adds the subject that uh, 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 overall to, to the first sentence, it, it, it addresses the, sub, uh, the missing subject case. And then the second part is, but the more prevalent belief is, again, it really says I'm merely communicating information. It is celebrated on this date to honor uh, the anniversary of Valentine's Day. It addresses both errors. Um, it, it, it addresses both, it adds both subjects. It, it, it keeps aspects one, two, and three in line. And uh, and yeah, it's a correct answer. A lot of people think, hey, what the hell is this that doing over here? How can a sentence begin with that? Um, a lot of people really say there should be a that over here. A lot of people say this is claimed is wrong. It's passive voice because of which this is wrong. How many of you made a mistake because of this? One of these three things. If you use the EGMAT method, um, okay, that's good. E discarded because it looked funny. Again, don't do that. Please do not discard something because it looks funny. Okay. There's nothing. On the GMAT, which says, hey, I've got to choose the most elegant sentence. Okay. Because you're biased towards C, I, I guess I didn't pay enough attention to D and E. Again, as I said, D and E are the only ones that, that should be contestants over here. And, and, and which is why when you think about this, 20 odd percent of people got this right, which makes this, you know, a difficult 700 level question, a challenging 700 level question. So for those of you saying this is an easy question, it's not an easy question. Okay. Another thing that you'd notice is how many sentence structures were there just in this one particular sentence? Yeah, if GMAT was about, were about elegance, then we would have, you know, grammarians they sing the GMAT. They don't. Let me be very clear. Okay. There were about 8 to 10 sentence structures in there. When you think about the combinations, 
because this each sentence each option had about four sentence structures in there and 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 you look at various combinations across the the, the five options then you could you see about eight to ten uh, in this because there's some of them repeated but then there were some some new ones as well and that's where mapping them to, to overall communicating that meaning is really really critical okay and but if you want to get to that 90th percentile you need to to solve such questions with very high accuracy and so very high means about 70 percent accuracy you've got to do it consistently and one of the other things that you would notice is if you spend that initial investment in time in in understanding the aspects of meaning rejecting all the incorrect options was really easy barring choice d rejecting everything was very very easy okay but then you don't get to this on day one let me be very clear someone asked this question can i get to score of 700 or higher in one month yes you can if you need a, you know help in just two subsections such as sc or number properties but then if you need help in more than two subsections then it becomes challenging why because wherever you need help and we need to go from the foundation to the method and then to refinement and this is when you get to that 90th percentile okay anyone who says getting there is easy hasn't delivered enough success um, you know uh, and, and doesn't know but the kind of effort that it needs to be put in okay for me this is absolutely critical you have the right foundation then this overall is about 14 hours per subsection okay this is where you need to spend about 30 to 50 hours per subsection depending on your starting ability and which is where most feedback is there in our st course for example they give you 90 personalized feedback points right then and there if you go on our website, watch this video and really say, how do we give you pers 500 personalized uh, uh, feedback points? Uh, you know, you'd be able to really see why a lot of that feedback is in stage one. Build a solid foundation. You can do well in, 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 in cementing and so on and so forth. Can we have one more example, please? Uh, you can have a lot more examples if you go to our YouTube channel uh, or attend the session next week or try the free trial out. You know, we have a comprehensive free trial, but it's uh, we're, I'm nine minutes over my uh, time, slotted time already. So and I also have a ton of questions in the Q&A pond that I need to take on. OK, but then just to tell you a bit about how much feedback we give just in the SC course. This is just for SC. Every other course is very, very similar. During stage one, you have about, you know, these 98 odd uh, feedback points here it's during stage two we have about between 30 and 50 personalized feedback points and then overall stage three about five to seven personalized feedback points and this is all built using technology there is no way i can personally deliver these many feedback points just because as a human we cannot keep track of so much information okay but technology repeated execution of technology can help you do that you you look at our planner the new one and you'd really see how it does a better job than any tutor can do in, in crafting a personalized study plan. Um, our current planner that we have, which is there for the current GMAT, uh, who does a job, and one of the top three experts on, on GMAT Club, and GMAT Club is about 400 experts. Our current planner is 80% is of what I can do. But our new planner goes well beyond my knowledge as well because it takes into account um, a lot more experiences than I personally can keep in my memory and, and accordingly the tech helps build that okay and which is where when people put their energy in the right direction it's not that our students are smarter one thing that let me just be very clear uh, our students are no smarter than students from other prep companies um, in fact we get way more students who are starting at a lower ability point than other prep companies do um, but then the fact really is we make sure that our students direct their energy in the right direction and then they react to feedback uh, overall and 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 once they those who react to feedback get to high scores automatically because frankly you hit the metrics there's no reason why you'd falter if you don't hit the metrics there's no way you can succeed it works it cuts both ways okay um which is where if you look at the uh, egmat as an organization we have we're about 44 people right now and about 22 of those are in either in subject matter or in tech the fewest folks that we have are in sales and marketing. That's a total of about five people over there. Uh, and and, and the, the next biggest department is customer success, which is what uh, leads our last mile push program. Okay. How do you know we are in which stage? Take a start Sigma X mock, you know, and then build your PSP.
All right. With that, I've come to the end of this webinar. Um, if you can give me some feedback on what you learned during this webinar, that will be fantastic. Also, I'm going to share my PDF, uh, the, the session PDF as well. Give me just one second. Let me share the session file over here. Here is the session file. Also, those of you who are asking for the Sigma X mock, you can see that over here. You can also see how we give concept level feedback. And then you can connect with me on LinkedIn in this case. All right. In GMAT Enhanced Core Report, what's the difference between um, uh, communication and grammar? So the communication uh, uh, type sentences, they're, they're, they're inferring meaning becomes slightly more challenging. In grammar, inferring meaning is, is, is much easier. So, you know, when, when someone asks the question, is the meaning absolutely clear in every question? And does the first option always provide the meaning? The answer is yes. And, and in the communication ones, you have to focus a bit more to get that meaning out. Okay. You can download the file here. You'll also get the recording by email. Okay. Which edition of GMAT should you give based on what objective criteria? So I mentioned before, um, you know, solve about 20 questions in SC and then solve about, you know, uh, another 30 questions in CR and RC and then another 10 questions in quant and another 20 questions in, in, um, in data insights. Then take a GMAT focus mock, look at uh, what score do you get, and then take another official mock, look at the score that you get. And, and that's one way to really say, wherever you have a higher starting ability, take, st start with that uh, GMAT. That's one way. The other thing is, you know, take a GMAT focus, take the GMAT focus mock after doing these questions and see if you like those questions, because frankly, if I were you, I would focus on, I would take the GMAT focus edition. In my opinion, that's a, a much more relevant test if you're aiming for a top B school. Uh, I, I like the GMAT focus edition more as well. Um, uh, so so that's what I would do. But then I understand many of you for them, for many of you, it's it's it's, it's a gateway into, uh, into, the, into your business school. That's your primary goal. So that's an objective way to figure this out. Using textbooks could help if you're on EG Mart. I, first of all, you know, I, I, I love books, but um, I love books in general for reading, not as a skill building thing. Just because, you know, we live in, in the 21st century where where we can give a lot more personalized feedback with regards to to, to learning than, uh, than books would give you. Also, in terms of learning, you'd learn a lot more um uh effectively using using online courses than than books so yeah i mean reading books will it help you absolutely if you're not doing something and then you read a book of course you create more knowledge and it will help you is it going to be as effective as an online course or one that has feedback built into it probably not okay especially good online courses uh again let me just say this you know there are lots of crappy online courses out there in every domain not just the gmart in every domain. In fact, most of the courses that came on came online early on were very crappy um, uh, in this case because it's very easy to build an online course and which is where I think online as a medium of instruction has gotten um, a bad repo. But then there are a few prep resources uh, where we are, people are investing a lot of time in building the right tech and building the right learning uh, and implementing the right learning pedagogy. And, and, and doing that is... Uh, is, is way more challenging than writing a book. If Pyle and I were to write a book in any domain of the GMAT, it would take us, you know, one tenth the time it takes us to build a course. How do you enroll in the course? Yes, if you go to a buy page, you know, you, you see the options that are there. You have three options, uh, two month, four month, and six month. The courses are all identical. They, just the duration varies. And um, and yeah, you go through that and you need any build.
I have no idea what this Aon website is. So I'm going to check it out. Any pros and cons between the two GMAT editions? So if you are aiming to apply in round two and Wharton and Harvard are schools that you want to apply to, then you've got to take the current GMAT. The focus edition, you know, these schools are not accepting it. Other than that, in my opinion, they're, they're both identical with regards to your probability to, to get into these schools. Do you have a paid module? What's the difference between free and paid modules? Yes, we do have a paid module. Again, remember, we spend close to a million dollars in R&D every year. So we have to make money some way. Um, in our free trial, we only offer 3 to 4% of everything that we have. So if you when you when you when you sign up, you you go to a free trial and you'll see on the top left hand corner of Waffle menu, you can see all our courses over there, uh, our, our analytics platform, our Scholarium, and, uh, and you can really see how much more content, how much more tracking uh, is there in the paid module. So 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 yeah, free trial is just two percent. I've found more many OG questions easier. Guys, questions in the QA pod, please. Uh, let me take that. I found many OG questions easier than what we got on Scholarium quizzing. So it's just solving non OG custom quizzes more than enough for GMAT prep. So let me just be very clear. Okay. Um, the Scholarium questions and the OG questions, um, they're built around the same foundation, but the errors that are tested on the GMAT. OG questions are not easier. Well, it's just that a lot of Scholarium questions are much more, um, they're segregated in, in, in a, in a, in a, in a uh in a, in a more cleaner way so if you're attempting hard questions then you've got to focus on just the the, the last 15 percent of official guide questions um overall so that's where you know we have about 35 percent of all our questions are hard on the official guide only 18 percent of questions are hard so so that's where og may give you a notion of of being easy but no Aon is a magazine of ideas and cultures as claimed by Google. So, so is reading that going to be useful? I mean, it, it expands your domain knowledge. So definitely, I'd, I'd say it is useful in that case, as long as it has articles which are of the relevant length. And as long as you have articles that make a point in a, in a very, fairly succinct manner, and which is where I, I, I recommend, um, you know, usually The Economist, which because the articles are usually three times the length of a GMAT RC passage, which is, you know, probably the shortest passage article that you would get that makes a, a point. And then the sentence structures that The Economist uses, they're very, very good sentence structures. I mean, the beautiful sentence structures. So, so when it comes to building your ability to identify sentence structures, identify relationships between sentences, The Economist does a phenomenal, provides a phenomenal resource over there. So, um, so that's where I would recommend if there's one magazine that, that, that you would do. And, and, you know, frankly, you get three or four old editions of the economics. That's enough for you with regards to doing that. There's just so much content in there. Since the focus edition is going to be different, there's 700 and the focus edition considered different. Then, yeah, absolutely. Seven of, first of all, there's no 700. There's a 7 of 5, which is 99 percentile. That's a 760 equivalent in the current on the current GMAT. So it is different, and the schools understand that because they, you know, the GMAC has been doing a phenomenal job educating the schools. Can I get some basic help with application college selection or feedback? Um, you can get some help with college selection or feedback. Again, remember, um, you know, we the, the, the reason why we don't provide this service, even though we can make way more money off it, it's just that at EGMAT, we have this philosophy. If we can't do uh, uh, something really well, I mean, if, if, if I cannot give my course to my kids, then I'm not going to give it to my students. That's the philosophy that we we follow, and 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 uh, which is where you know when it comes to admission consulting, tech, the tech that was needed to 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 build a product that is as personalized as a good product can be or should be in the admissions consulting space without a human intervention. That's something that that tech didn't exist till about three years back. It does exist now, so there's something that we will do in the next year or so. Um, but but as of now, since we don't have it. We don't offer that, but yes, if you need, if you need a, if you need to brainstorm something to really say, hey, this is what my score is, this is what my background is, this is where I want to go, these are the schools that I'm looking for, and here is why, 
am I thinking in the right direction? Absolutely. You know, we do have a lot of experience in that space and we can really help you with that. RD says, I'm cutting the current GMAT courses with PSP. Is the PSP that I have now the most updated one? Um, now, not the most updated one. No, it's not RD. You have the current production PSP, which is for the current GMAT. We have a GMAT focus PSP. If you write to me at Project that he does GMAT and say, I want to try out the new PSP, um, please uh, do that. Uh, and 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 we'll, we'll actually give you access to the new PSP. But then you will have to promise to give me feedback on that. And, um, and, and yeah. Jagruti says, what should be the strategy if one spends um, the majority of time learning concepts and yet hits a score plateau after solving a good number of questions? So Jagruti, um, if, you're, if you're doing a good job learning concepts, which means if your concept files and your application files and the corresponding practice quiz scores are good, you're, you're not likely... To, to to get stuck during the cementing stage. If you are getting stuck during the cementing stage, most likely you're not following the process while cementing. So the first strategy for us is to really, we, we ask students, how are you solving questions? What do you do in step one? What do you do in step two? What do you do in step three? The next thing that we do is we ask them to take cementing quizzes and relax time. Remember, they have standard timing and relaxed timing. There's a reason why that relaxed, relaxed timing is built into those quizzes. Once you do that, you get through it. Okay, good question, but what data tells us is if you've done a good job, then that's not going to happen. Akshay says, um, you know, the Niji Mass student, would you, would you recommend that uh, 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 I study both quant and verbal together if I'm starting with a 530 and I want to get to a 760? Uh, and the, the answer is, please don't do that if you're a working professional. Only do that if you can spend four hours or more per day. If you can't do four hours or more per day consistently, then please do not do that. Focus on one. Remember, you're starting at a 530, which means you're starting at a, a below 50th percentile, likely in in either verbal or quant, or or you have it in both verbal and quant because your overall GMAT score is below the median GMAT score. Okay. Can I practice GMAT club slash OG questions while I go through the module? Again, please do not do that. Remember, when, when we build the EGMAT course architecture, there are two people who actually architect the course before we even write the first question. And, 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 and there's a lot of harmony that we, we ensure between the files. What happens when you practice questions that are not relevant is those questions have skills that, are, that you've not learned. And, and and essentially, when it comes to, and, and this is something that a lot of you have experienced, it's very easy to get distracted during GMAT preparation. And, 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 and when you solve questions outside of the prescribed curriculum, during the learning phase, and let me be very certain, during the learning phase, you find something that's just one more concept that you say, maybe I should learn this at this point, and, and maybe, and then I would have gotten this question right. And that's when you get distracted, because that one question, that one concept is if it's not taught in the right way, it leads you into into another concept, into another concept, into another concept, and uh, and and that's where you know life becomes hell. You kind of waste the time uh, that you had allocated to study from the module, and then you come back and say, "Oh, what was I learning again?" Right? That happens, right? So so no, don't solve questions on G from GMAT Club. Also, when you solve questions. Um, the solutions that you get, they are not great solutions on GMAT Club, guys. So, what's the strategy to re revisit errors? Build the behavioral error log that we that we that we recommend that you build, and that's the the strategy to revisit errors. The other thing is bookmark questions uh, that 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 you get wrong in the practice quizzes, make notes along those questions and, 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 and revise those notes. Okay, let's look at the, the short answer part here. Can I get a PSP on trial version? Yes, write to me. How hard will the focus edition be compared to the classic? Uh, it depends on where you're coming from. If you're a grammarian, you're going to find it harder because, you know, your, your SC is gone and now, um, now you have DEI, which is not going to be as natural for you. 
uh, and what focus code would be considered on at par with uh, with a 6750 classic that's 695 is the session anytime soon for CR? Yes, next Saturday's session is a CR session. Um, if you go to egmat.com, go to the free trial, you should be able to see the, the sign up link for that. Uh, uh, also on our public website, Q51 V39, V fabulous quant score, really good verbal score. Is there a GMAT verbal only module? So we don't have a verbal only module available, but you can buy a one month option. Again, write to me at Rajadarid has GMAT. Say you have this score. And, and and then you know also ask for the LMP program because you're eligible for the LMP program. But yeah, definitely we can help you. So so um, since the focus edition is going to be different, will a 700 score be considered different? Yeah, no, it won't be. It's still about percentiles. Again, remember, think about what the GMAT does. It 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 puts you in buckets and it allows it gives the B schools an objective criteria to to choose one student over the other. And and you know. 645, 655 is that 700 bucket. And, and you know, uh, because it's it's that 90th percentile bucket, that 645, 655 score is going to be that much more challenging than, than, than a 700 or, or a 705. Has anyone over here uh, 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 um, uh, heard of IB, International Baccalaureate? It's, it's a it's a program which is uh, for, for uh, followed by international schools has anyone heard of ib Okay, for those of you who don't know what IB is, it's, it's an international baccalaureate. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an alternate to CBSC in, um, in, in, in 11, for 11th and 12th graders um, uh, overall in India and alternate to the regular programs um, overall. Um, and um, and, and in, in IB, it's out of greater out of 45, it's a 45 point scale or you know, 32, 32 to 45, or 27 to 45, I believe. I don't know as much about the lower end scale. I know about the upper end scale. Now, only 15% of the people score 40 or higher on IB. And, and so it's, it's a very um, uh, differentiating scale, which is very different from the plus two scales in, in, in India or in general, the regular GPAs in, in schools in, in the US. And, and uh, when you apply with an IB score to a university, and let's say you have a 41 out of 45, uh, top schools already know, hey, this means that, that you are amongst the 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 top four top five percent of schools students anywhere in the world and you are way better than a 95th percentage student uh, in cbsc because the 95th percentage student is still an 80th percentile student in in cbsc uh, so bottom line is even though you may have a 655 on gmat focus schools already know how to translate that into which bucket you you um, uh, you belong to okay Do EG matters automatically get an LMP plan from the mentors two weeks before the exam, or do you have to request to enroll separately? You do have to request. That's something which is there. Um, and, and also, you do have to meet a certain criteria. When you read the article, you'd really see everything that's out there on the article. In fact, for most things, if you go to EG Math's blog, you'd be able to understand uh, a lot about everything that we offer, including, I mean, we have an entire section on GMAT focus. You can also see actual plans, actual successes uh, of of, uh, uh, of LMP, and what are some of the terms and conditions that you have to go through. Age of Ayush, uh, twenty eight, when he took um, uh, when he attempted the GMAT, uh, uh, he his, his interviews are on our on our YouTube channel as well. You can really sign up for that. You can watch this. How can I schedule a strategy session? Again, write to Rajat Adida GMAT. And, and 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 we will then see again remember we uh, at egmat we work a lot asynchronously we work a lot with a lot more detailed information but if you send us information and we find that hey 
we need to do a call with you, we'll, we'll do one. But in every case, we make sure that you have a solution that will lead you to success. Okay. All right, guys, with that, I want to thank you guys for being, uh, for spending this time with me. I know for those of you who are from India, it's about 10 p.m. your time. For those of you who are um, uh, from the East Coast, uh, it's, it's uh, what, uh, half past noon your time, I believe. And then um, for those of you in California, it's 9.30 a.m. your time. So Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Sunday afternoons. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it takes a lot, uh, it takes a lot to, to spend time with me. So thank you very much. How many people attended this webinar? I think we, throughout the, the two and a half odd hours, we had about 240, 250 people who joined and left. The peak was about 140, 145. Link to mock exam uh, in in the, over here. It says one dot sigmax mock. That's a link to mock exam. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful day.